In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. These things have I spoken to you, that you may not be scandalized. The expression, to be scandalized, means here, as in many other passages of the Holy Scriptures, to fail in confidence toward God, to lose hope in Him. Today, I wish to elaborate on how the consideration of the mystery of the Ascension leads us to confidence in God, the virtue of hope, and on the practical thermometer when advancing in holiness, which is measured by the virtue of obedience. With the sin of Adam and the Garden of Eden, original sin, man lost the first grace and was subject to the effects of sin and death. But man was not abandoned by God. God promised to our first parents a Redeemer. And so, the second person of the Blessed Trinity became a man through the Incarnation. Through his passion, Christ redeemed us and opened the gates of heaven. But upon ascending back into heaven, our Lord Jesus Christ did not abandon us either. He remains forever present in our midst, hidden in every tabernacle, waiting for us to come visit him and to come to us daily in Holy Communion. St. Augustine said, Do you want proof that whatever happens is for our good? This is it. God has said, I will never abandon you. I will be with you always. If a gentleman should promise you this, you would trust him. God makes this promise to you, and do you doubt it? Do you want a stronger foundation for belief than the word of God, which is infallible? Yes, he promised it. He wrote it. He has given his word, so rest assured. After his ascension, Christ sent us the Holy Ghost, the paraclete, as mentioned at the beginning of today's gospel. Paraclete means a comforter or also an advocate inasmuch as by inspiring prayer, the Holy Ghost prays as it were in us and pleads for us. In such a way, the Holy Ghost comes to us to give us testimony of Christ, and so in turn to aid us to give testimony and bear witness that Christ is indeed the Son of God. What virtue do we we require for bearing witness? We require confidence in God, or hope, which is founded on faith, founded on the knowledge of God, of his power, his goodness, his love, and his promises, which are made known to us by the incarnate Son of God. Hope, thus established on faith, enables us to stand true to God and to possess our souls in peace amidst the trials and the seductions of of this world, to be firmly attached to God as by the anchor of the soul, as St. Paul calls it. As Catholics, we should be recognized by the supernatural virtue of hope in God. St. Ambrose teaches that when we find ourselves in some danger, we must not lose courage, but firmly trust in God. For where there is the greatest danger, there is also the greatest help from him who wants to be called our help in times of peace and in times of tribulation. Here is an interesting anecdote from the life of St. Ignatius of Loyola. When his ship was caught in a great storm at sea, St. Ignatius was the only one on board who was not mourning nor trembling in fear of death. He was cheerful and unafraid, in fact reflecting that without God's permission, storms cannot come up or death take anyone. There are some whose confidence in God is so strong that they cannot abandon it, even in extreme or desperate cases. How dear to God are those souls, and how much he helps them. Although the Emperor Ferdinand II saw his enemies leagued against him and his lands devastated, he never lost confidence in God, but always said, God will see me safely through this storm. Nor was he disappointed, because when his cause seemed most desperate, he won a great victory over all his enemies. What case was more desperate than Susanna's in the Old Testament? 
falsely accused, condemned, and led to her death, she still trusted in God and was freed. Now, theological hope is a habit divinely infused which enables man with perfect confidence based on God's almighty help to await and obtain eternal happiness and the means necessary for obtaining it. Hope deals with eternal happiness and the means leading precisely to that happiness. The motive of hope is the almighty power of God providing help to his creatures. Hope is founded on faith and requires it. Hope is destroyed by formal heresy, which destroys faith, its foundation. Hope is also destroyed by excess in presumption and by defect in despair. A special property of hope is its steadfastness, insofar as it is based on the help of God. There is, however, some fear and uncertainty in the virtue of hope inasmuch as it supposes our own cooperation. This steadfastness of hope is evident from the words of the Council of Trent. Everyone must place and put the most steadfast hope in the help of God. The mere facts of Christ's ascension and of this special gift he has made to us of sending us the Holy Ghost ought to be ample motives inspiring and inflaming within us the supernatural virtues of hope and confidence in God. Saint Alphonsus Rodriguez said that he who does not lose heart when faced with unforeseen adversities, but immediately turns to God with confidence, gives evidence of being well rooted in this virtue. I mentioned before the two sinful extremes that ruin this salutary hope. On the one hand, by excess, man can fall into presumption, which is a rash confidence of obtaining eternal salvation by means other than those determined by God. On the other hand, by defect, man can fall into despair, which is giving up on eternal happiness by judging it to be impossible of attainment. By presumption, the sinner thinks he does not need God to be happy. By despair, the sinner distrusts even God, thus denying God's infinite power and goodness by throwing himself into seeking consolation in the mire of sin. How hideous. Now, what are the remedies? To begin, prayer. And with God's grace paired to a sincere effort on our part to abandon our sin, we must seek then the reward of our eternal happiness to be found in that perfect union with God in heaven and perform meritorious good works here in this life. Our Lord said, without me, you can do nothing. This thesis is defeated. We are incapable of performing any good works meritorious of an eternal reward without the very aid and assistance of God's grace. And so God demands our confidence, faith, and hope in him. Wait a moment. Christ also said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So translated into the practical order, we ought to put this hope into action. We ought to demonstrate our hope in God by observing the commandments, the precepts of the church, and the instructions of our superiors, our parents, and our teachers. It is in this manner that obedience, as a virtue, is the most obvious sign of making a veritable effort in living and practicing Catholic spirituality, of keeping hope, and safeguarding a confidence in God. It acts as a practical thermometer to measure our application to virtue and the love of God. Let us analyze for a quick moment this virtue of obedience. Obedience is the moral virtue which inclines the will to comply with the will of another who commands. True obedience consists not in the mere physical fulfillment of a commanded act, 
when, for example, you say you are sorry because you were forced to do so without really meaning it. But obedience consists in doing some act precisely because it is commanded by a superior. In the rule of St. Benedict, the holy abbot stresses that the several steps and degrees of humility are characterized by obedience. An obedience without delay, a perfect obedience. For we have the maxim of our Lord wherein he says, I came not to do my will, but his who sent me. See also how a more perfect humility is that by which one, for the love of God, subjects himself in all obedience to his superiors, imitating Christ, of whom the apostle says, made obedient even unto death. Another step in humility, as found in the Benedictine rule, is that a monk do nothing but what the common rule of the monastery and the example of his seniors suggest. In fact, religious hold that the virtue of obedience is so important that it is one of the three vows of professed religious. Just as in today's epistle we read, but before all things have a constant mutual charity among yourselves, for charity covereth a multitude of sins, using hospitality one towards another without murmuring. So Saint Benedict prescribes in his rule that the excellence of obedience is not only to be shown by all towards the abbot, but likewise let the brethren also be obedient among themselves, bearing in mind that by this way of obedience, they will be journeying Godwards. Thus obedience is also the sign of charity, being also a sign of true humility. St. John of the Cross said that obedience is a penance of the intellect and therefore a more acceptable sacrifice than all corporal penances. Hence God loves our tiniest act of obedience more than all other homages you might think of offering him. It is related in the lives of the fathers of the desert that one day four monks went to the abbot Pambo and separately told him of the virtues they were practicing. One fasted a great deal. The second had given up all earthly possessions. The third had a great fervor and the fourth had been under obedience for 22 years. After having heard each one separately, the abbot said, the virtue of the fourth is greater than yours because each of you follow your own will while he has made himself a servant to the will of others. Therefore, obedience as exemplified by Christ, by the saints and by the Blessed Virgin Mary is a sure sign and thermometer, so to speak, to prove and pinpoint our advance in virtue and spiritual progress. The great Saint Teresa of Avila summed this up with these words. The more clearly it is seen that one is unwilling to obedience in some matter, the more evident it is that the point in question is a temptation. When God sends some inspiration, the first one he sends is to obey. As we are completing this month of May, which is especially dedicated to Our Lady, remember to earn extra graces and favors by petitioning in your daily rosary for this virtue of obedience and for a sincere confidence in God. Seek to imitate her most perfect obedience to God and her most steadfast confidence and hope. May the virtue of obedience motivate and prompt you to be a more perfect and more holy obedience. And may further meditation into this special mystery of Christ's ascension into heaven be a further motive of increasing your confidence in God and steadfastness in prayer. Pray that our Lord grant us that by meditating on his ascension, we may increase daily in acts of hope and perfect and perfect our obedience to him, to the church, and to our superiors. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.